today fortunate to have our next speaker, Michael Armstrong, from the city of Portland, the senior manager in sustainability and who has been an integral part of the planning and the progress that the city of Portland has made to become one of the prime examples of a city of, on sustainability in the country. So we're here to present Michael Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Thank you, much. Thank you so much, Toby, and I'm really honored to share the stage here this afternoon. And I want to pick up a little bit on the, the theme of transformation that Linda was just talking about, the transformation that's underway on this campus. Um, Lacey spoke earlier about individual transformation. We are in the midst of a transformation of sorts at, at the city of Portland. Um, and this is, it's not new, but we've really only just begun. So I want to start just a little bit of rapid fire, or, or there we go, okay. A little bit of rapid fire, um, kind of reminding myself and maybe all of us what it is that we, we love about Portland, um, the, some of the views, uh, where our water comes from. That's Bull Run there. Uh, we've got our walkable neighborhoods, sidewalk cafes. We have beverages being served. We have farmer's markets. We have activities in the park, people outside, people interacting with one another. Um, we have all sorts of green infrastructure and support. There are all these fabulous things. Um, again, parks, activity, outdoors. These are really, really exceptional things. Green buildings, infrastructure. However, it hasn't always been this way. And I think sometimes in Portland, we, we're fortunate to presume that it's just like that. And you know, all well, Portland's different. And um, to those who've been around, they, they know it hasn't always been this way, but for some of us, and, and I include myself in this, I need to remind myself, Portland hasn't always been the way it is. So, uh, as recently as the 1970s, you know, we had the brown cloud before Denver did. You know, we were dirty before it was cool. Uh, we had 180 days of air quality violations a year. Um, we had, um, we invested a lot of money to make our streets wider, to make room for cars. Burnside in the 1930s, the street was widened, the facades of buildings were taken down, the buildings were made smaller, and then the facades reattached to make more room for cars. We don't have sidewalks where we need them. So this is a, a current map. So the red is sidewalks in Portland, and if you look to East Portland or parts of Southwest, we don't have nearly the sidewalks we need. Um, we've got big challenges. We got a bike lane there on the left, we don't have a sidewalk. And where does that leave our families? You can see again on the, in the right-hand side. So we've got big challenges on our hand. We've come a long way, but we've got a long way to go. Um, I think it's really, really useful to remind ourselves we've made these choices before, and we get to choose our future. And if we're serious about dealing with climate change, we need to choose a future that is a, a really successful, vibrant city that doesn't require carbon emissions to succeed. And so we got to look back and remind ourselves, Portland hasn't always been the way it is today, and in the future, it, it can't look the way it does now. And so we've got you know, the, these wonderful stories of, of Waterfront Park. Used to be six lanes of traffic, now it's a park. We've got right in the very center of Portland, um, what in the 60s was a surface parking lot, and you'll recognize this if you look at some of the buildings around it, the surface parking lot was proposed to be a parking garage, 10 stories of parking right in the very center of the city, and people said there's got to be a better way, and the better way became Pioneer Courthouse Square. So that was proposed to be a 10-story parking garage, and people chose a different alternative. Those are the kinds of decisions we're making, if not every day, certainly every year now, and we need to be really deliberate about creating the kind of community we want that doesn't rely on fossil fuels. So, you probably have noticed I work for the city's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, so we do big picture long term. That's what we're about, but we, we do it with an eye to making a community that's it's for the benefit of the people who live in it and for the long-term health of everyone involved. And so this is the kind of thing we think about. A Couple more examples, you know, Stumptown is not just a brand of coffee, um, but it's what Portland looked like for many, many years, and that too has changed. This big picture planning that, that we embark on and that we try to do as a community effort is really enshrined in the, in the Portland plan. Uh, this was adopted by city council in 2012. This to me really underscores 
we need to solve for carbon emissions, but we need to solve for carbon emissions in a way that create a really successful community. And so as you look at all these measures of success, one of them is reduced carbon emissions. And it, it's a particularly challenging one to get to, but if you look at the other things on that list, starting with equity and inclusion, resident satisfaction, educated youth, all the way on down, safer city, all of these things are they're big, they're difficult, and we need to do them at the same time. And so the Portland plan is where we're establishing a framework for addressing all of these things, and we, we tie them together. And one of the things that ties them together is people and creating a community that that's, creates opportunities for everyone in it. All right, so I brought along one little prop here. Um, and if you laugh at this, you're simply betraying your age. But I have in my little hand, I hear some laughter. I hear some people betraying their age. I have in my hand these five and a quarter inch floppy diskettes that contain Portland's first climate action plan from 1993, or at least the data that went into it. Um, and it's both, to me, it, it's a reminder of um, how much things have changed. Um, and it's really gratifying that in Portland, we really, we have this fantastic legacy, these building blocks, foundations, that our work is now um, hopefully improving upon, but certainly building upon. It's also, it's really striking to go back and read that 1993 plan, because number one, the science was pretty clear then. Number two, the solutions that are in the 93 plan are the same ones that are priorities today, because we know what they are. These are not grand mysteries. Technology is helping, it's getting better and better, but it's really clear what we need to do. So as we look back at the, the history of climate planning in Portland, it's both, I mean, I'm so grateful that we have this 20 year head start. Um, it's also, it's a little shocking that we've, we've done some really good work, we have a really long way to go, um, and we know exactly what it is we need to do. So this little bit goes back to the opening slides, all the things we love about Portland. So much and, and so many good things have already happened, reductions in household energy. Um, vehicle miles traveled are going down per person. Um, gasoline sales are going way down. It's really bad for our transportation revenue. It's really good for quality of life and carbon emissions. You can go on down the list. All of these things have happened over the last 20 odd years. You put all that together in terms of carbon emissions and you see, you, you get a graph that's beginning to be pretty encouraging. Um, total carbon emissions in Multnomah County have declined a little more than 11% since 1990, and that's despite population growth of about 30%. So we've got 30% more people, we've got about 15% more jobs, and yet carbon emissions have gone down. So that's encouraging. And what's also encouraging about this, you know, you, you get see the gap open between emissions locally and emissions nationally. Uh, th that's good, I think that's deserved. I think Portland has started moving on these things earlier than other parts of the country, but the fact that the national line is beginning to bend as well is absolutely essential. We need to see the national trend and the global trend come the same direction. So we've got a, a good story to tell, um, but we have a long way to go, and the long way to go is really illustrated by the same 80% goal that we share with, uh, with Portland Community College. So 80% reduction by 2050, 40% by 2030, and the sooner the better. And so you can see that um, at a very rough level to the naked eye, we're not that far behind schedule, uh, but we are behind schedule, and we've got a really long way to go. And we really need to keep our eye on that successful community in 2050 that's a place we actually wanna live in. So I want to touch very briefly just on a couple of uh, illustrations of things that are, are underway now, and then I want to turn the stage over here. Um, so this is the current climate action plan for the city of Portland. We are, we are in the process right now of updating this. So there will be a 2014 version that comes to city council, the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners later this year. We need to continually figure out where we're going next with this. The long-term goals are clear. The near-term actions need to be refreshed. I said earlier how important it is to us that the carbon goals be linked with a variety of other community goals, and that it really is fundamental. We need to make sure we're doing this in ways that make a, a fairer community, that give us jobs, that help carry out our watershed, ma uh, watershed management plan, help achieve all these other goals, and that's, that's really important if we're successful. So the plan is broken down into these eight areas. I, I'm just gonna touch on a couple of examples. 
Uh, one of them is around urban form and mobility, something the city has a pretty strong say in, in terms of the shape of the community, how our transportation systems intersect. Our goal really is to get walkable neighborhoods and to connect those neighborhoods with good transportation options. That's transit, it's bicycles, it's, we'll see what it is over time, but those two things for sure. But it only works if the neighborhoods themselves are walkable, and so a lot of our effort is around shaping walkable neighborhoods. A couple slides on bicycling. Um, I think it was Lacey who mentioned the you know, impressive figures for the number of people who get around Portland by bike. This is a map back in 1990, so that's the city of Portland there. The black lines are the bicycle network that was in place in 1990, and then the shading is the percent of people getting to work by bicycle. So I'll bring it forward through time and watch for the spread of the little black lines, that's the bike network, and then the shading. So coming forward in 2000, lots more black lines and lots more shading. Bring it forward again, 2007, and I got one more, 2008, and obviously we have gotta get updated numbers in there it continues to grow. So we're both getting higher percentages close in, but it's beginning to spread. We need to continue investing in that network because that's what really makes it functional. This is percent commuting by bike comparing Portland to other cities. And to me, this really underscores we are in the midst of a transformation. Things haven't always been this way. So Portland likes to think of itself as a bicycling city, but in 2000, we were no more of a biking city than Minneapolis, Seattle, or San Francisco. We were all at exactly the same level. So just in the last you know, 12, 13 years, things have really started to change. Uh, where do they go from here? We'll see. Can we be like Amsterdam, Copenhagen? Um, we need a whole different scale on our y-axis there. So those numbers are still pretty small. Um, you know, this is uh, high praise on a low scale. So we, we do have our work cut out for us, but we also have something pretty good to build on. This, this dramatizes that distinction that Portland enjoys. This is um, cities across the bottom, U.S. cities and the point change in percent um, bicycling to work from 2000 to 2009. Portland is the, the big, big column at the far left. So we really are changing quickly and faster than other places, but almost all those lines are going in the right direction. We need other cities to do this too, and they are. You take the biking stuff, the walking stuff, population growth, we're starting to drive less. That's really, really good. It's good for public health. It's good for people's pocketbooks. It's good for air quality. It's good for carbon emissions. There's every reason to do it. All right, I talked about walkable neighborhoods. And you know, this notion that some of it is about being able to walk to things that you want to walk to. It's about access. Some of it is about habit. And we have gotten used to not walking as much. And that's something else, you know, we can all take into consideration. It's not so crazy to walk. I showed the map earlier of sidewalks, and we've got parts of the city that are not very walkable, and we need to address that. So this is a, a heat map. This, is, this predates walk score, which is a fantastic tool. Um, this analysis is a little more refined about what makes a community walkable, because it's both access to things you want to walk to. It's not just coffee and beer, but a lot of it's coffee and beer. It's also, are there sidewalks? Do the streets connect? How steep is it? And is there a highway between you and where you need to get to? You gotta mash all those things together to get a sense for how walkable something is, uh, an area is, and then it also reveals what you need if you wanna have it more walkable. So that's what we're working on. Okay, one other example here. Um, those of you who live in the city of Portland in single family houses may recall um, that your garbage used to be picked up every week and now it's picked up every other week, but you can put food scraps and anything else that'll compost into your green bin, which we pick up every week. So big change when this went into effect in 2011. Um, it's been really successful. So we've got a 37% reduction in garbage immediately. We got a threefold increase in the amount of composting and recycling has stayed about the same. I think at this point there's a small increase, but it, it's about the same. So we made these changes. Um, solid waste rates went down last year. Um, we will release them shortly for this year, take them to city council. If, if you wanna know, you should come look, um, but it's pretty good news again. So this program is really delivering results. It was a big transition for a lot of people. It's not easy for everyone. We think it's really working well. So 
an illustration of the scale of change that we need and how quickly things can change. Okay, last thing, and this this will echo some of the work that PCC is doing. You know, we're we're also a big public agency. We run a lot of stuff. We've got big opportunities ourselves, and so that's everything from swapping out the traffic signals. Every traffic signal in Portland has been an LED bulb for more than 10 years now. We're now in the process of working on all of the street lights in town. 56,000 or so will be converted to LEDs. It'll be the biggest energy efficiency project the city has ever done. About 10% of our carbon emissions just with that one project, it pays for itself. It's the kind of thing we, we certainly need to be doing. Um, it's the kind of opportunities that a lot of big organizations have. A couple other examples, and this is the LED street light project, a, a really big project. All of those kind of ghoulish, garish yellow lights that we have at night, they'll be replaced with something that's a lot closer to moonlight. Think of it as moonlight. It's nice light, and it's coming to, to you in Portland. All right, so I want to conclude with this has got to be about people. We need to solve for climate change in ways that create a better place for people to live. I think cities have a lot of opportunities to do that. Um, we're really focused on doing that in Portland. We cannot do it alone. This comes back to this takes all of us. It's in our interest. We're the ones who can make it happen. So we really look forward to working with all of you, um, with the others today, uh, on this going forward. So thank you very much. Portland is known for our beer, music, and coffee, but I think more importantly, Portland is known nationwide for being one of the greenest cities in, in the country. Poppy, can we make Portland greener? Yes, yes we can.